Hello and welcome to our third night of coverage of the Republican National Convention here at 538. There's a lot going on in the country as a backdrop to everything we're going to see tonight, which is first and foremost a speech from Vice President Mike Pence. But of course, there's also what appears to be a Category 4 hurricane headed towards the border of Texas and Louisiana. And violence broke out last night in Kenosha, Wisconsin, where a 17-year-old from Illinois has been arrested for intentional homicide after shooting two protesters, uh, three protesters killing two. So there's a lot going on. We'll see how much the Republican National Convention addresses these two crises that are going on in the nation right now. But here with me to preview some of that and what we might expect are elections analyst Nathaniel Rakich. Hey, Nathaniel. Hey, Galen. And politics editor Sarah Frostenson. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Galen. As I mentioned, there's a lot of news in the country apart from the Republican National Convention. Earlier this week, a black man in Kenosha, Wisconsin, was shot multiple times by the police. He's alive, but his condition going forward is unclear. There have been protests and rioting in Kenosha since then. Then we saw on Tuesday night that people from Illinois outside of Wisconsin went to Kenosha. One of those people, a teenager, ended up shooting two protesters uh, at, who died, and then another protester shot in the arm. He's arrested at this point. So there's a lot going on here, as well as the hurricane, as I mentioned. Let's talk about what's going on in Kenosha first. How has the Republican National Convention responded to it so far, and what might we expect going forward? I think the short answer is it really hasn't um, taken a forceful stance on what's happened. There was in the prayer and invocation last night um, some mention of Jacob and what is happening. But you think back to night one with the McCloskeys, who were the couple in St. Louis who, you know, famously were captured on tape, you know, brandishing their firearms against Black Lives Matter protesters in the St. Louis area earlier this summer. And something we've been looking at and paying attention to is, you know, are there coded dog whistles about race encoded in the RNC when they talk about how they are going to, you know, crack down on crime? And a lot of that's been coded in the suburbs and not so subtly. So it'll be interesting tonight because at the same time, I think they have tried to show the work they did on the criminal justice reform last year. How will they will they take a forceful stance tonight? I think they have to address it, right? That has been leading, I think, news sites today and not last night of the RNC. So it will be a glaring absence if they don't engage with that in some way, even if that requires, you know, adjusting the schedule. Yeah, there are a couple of speakers on tonight's schedule who are supposed to address uh, Trump's support for law and order, the kind of distinction between peaceful protesting and rioting, and it will definitely be interesting to see if they mention the situation in Kenosha. I would think they would have to because I think the absence from a speech that is about um, kind of these adjacent topics would be very glaring. I know this week we're focused on the RNC, but have we heard anything from Joe Biden or Kamala Harris addressing the violence in Wisconsin so far? Yeah, uh, today Joe Biden tweeted a video in which he you know, said how uh, appalled he was by the shooting of Jacob Blake. He also reportedly spoke to Jacob Blake's family. Um, so he's definitely been on uh, on keeping tabs at least on the issue and and uh, addressing it virtually. Um, I think it's also fair to say that if the rules were reversed and the DNC were this week rather than the RNC, we would be hearing a lot about this issue given how often the Democrats brought up the Black Lives Matter protests, um, George Floyd, etc. Yeah, so what we can perhaps expect to hear from Republicans about what's going on in Kenosha tonight. Certainly, you would expect a different tone from what you would hear from Democrats and maybe more emphasis on some of the rioting, uh, you know, but of course, we'll see. There's another lurking crisis, as I mentioned, which is this, you know, what looks to be a category four hurricane. Uh, Sarah, you're in Houston. Uh, what are we expecting? Um, and does it seem like the RNC is adjusting at all at this point to address that? Well, you know, Galen, it's interesting. I, I actually think some of the hurricane is going to bypass here in Houston and actually hit um, Beaumont in Louisiana, so the east of us, and Lake Charles. 
But setting that aside, you know, last night with Reynolds, the governor in Iowa, talking about how Trump stepped in for, you know, delivering aid to the state, which I had argued on the live blog was kind of a perfunctionary function of the presidency that you would expect a president to do. Um, So in some ways, if there was a disaster in the area and not in any ways hoping for that, but you could see that being a political opportunity for Republicans, especially given Abbott is a Republican governor here in Texas, if some of the um, worst aspects of the storm were concentrated here. Otherwise, though, I haven't seen from the lineup how that would be addressed in that this evening. But that could be an opportunity, especially if Trump is trying to brand himself as a more empathetic leader, to step in and make sure the people affected by the hurricane were given the aid they needed. Yeah, I think that, you know, because hurricanes aren't like a cultural, a culture war issue, the way that the Black Lives Matter protests are, it'll be a lot easier for just every speaker tonight to maybe lead off by saying, and our prayers are with people in the path of the storm. Um, You know, I agree with Sarah that it is an opportunity for Trump, but I also think it's a potential um, pitfall for him, as we saw, you know, I mean, obviously the comparisons with George W. Bush and Hurricane Katrina come easily anytime there's a hurricane these days. Um, But I think that, you know, given that Trump is going to be giving his speech, which is a very explicitly political appeal tomorrow at a time when we might be getting our first images of the destruction from Louisiana and Texas, I think that maybe could come, uh, maybe could produce a not so great split screen for President Trump. Um, It's maybe beneficial for him that he's giving his speech from the White House so he can say, you know, I've been monitoring the storm activity all uh, day. It might be harder, you know, this is kind of the kind of thing that, frankly, if this were an in-person convention, um, you might be considering uh, postponing the speech or having the president deliver it, you know, moving it to Washington, D.C., um, because, you know, it's not the kind of time that you would want the president to be traveling to a political event. So keeping all of those unplanned factors in mind heading into tonight, the main speaker pre-planned of the evening is Vice President Pence. What kind of message are we expecting from him? More of a member of the old guard of the Republican Party than many of the people that we've heard thus far. In some ways, I would think we got a precursor to what he's going to talk about tonight in terms of policy from the log cabin Lincoln-esque style video shot in Indiana that aired last night. He won't have the backdrop of talking with voters in the same way, but I would expect Pence to drill in on the successes of the administration in the last four years while also casting forward to what a Trump administration could look like in the next four years. I think one of Pence's skills as Trump's vice president is not only speaking to the policies and helping relay to the public what they're accomplishing or what they're doing, um, but is also humanizing Trump in some of those elements as well. So I'll be looking to see if that's on display tonight as well. Uh, Personally, I'm going to be looking for some of the other speakers. Um, It looks like Republicans are really starting to feature their um, younger rising stars tonight. So Elise Stefanik, who before Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was the youngest woman ever elected to the House of Representatives. Um, Madison Cawthorn, who is who just turned 25 years old, who won a Republican primary in North Carolina um, and is all but guaranteed to go to Congress. They're both speaking tonight. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, maybe if they try to reach out to younger voters or just starting to build the bridge of a uh, uh, for a Republican Party to uh, you know, reach out to a, a generation that doesn't seem to like them very much. And women writ large, it looked like from the lineup of speakers, they're airing tonight um, on the side of including a lot more women within the party, but then also, um, you know, regular, ordinary American women sharing their stories as well. All right. Well, given all of the news that we discussed and this preview of the evening, we have a lot to follow tonight. And folks can follow us over on the 538 Live blog at 538.com and also listen to our reaction later this evening on the 538 Politics podcast. But that's it for now. So thank you, Nathaniel and Sarah. Thanks, Thanks, Galen. Galen. And make sure to subscribe to 538 on YouTube, wherever the button is. I still haven't learned. There, there, right there. See you later.